Welcome everyone on board. We are 30 odd people in this morning, afternoon, midnight, evening, and different time zones from uh, the Rainbow region of Australia to Adelaide uh, to Tunisia to El Salvador, Ario, US, and uh, our Indian mentors, poets and all fellow travelers in the sea of poetry. Let me begin with the first lines, first few lines from Bashudara's own book. Preface, placing a new book of poems in the hands of the world is like sending children off to school for the first time, mesmerizing and so different. And the preface itself talks about how this book reads differently. And I think many of us have already received hard copies of the book as well as the soft copies, and the book is refreshing rate. I'll come to the last line of the preface. As I send these poems out into the world, I only hope that they meet eager readers, happy, happy love. Yes, it's the world now, Bashudara, because we are from your personal poetry, your poetry from Jamsepur has, uh, has a connection with the world branch of poetry. Poets from Australia, Tunisia, India, US, and El Salvador. We will celebrate the spirit of love through poetry. We will begin our launch speeches by none other than Professor Anishur Rahman, who is a mentor for many of us for many seasons, formerly a professor of English at Jamia Millia Islamia, New Delhi, as a critic, translator, bilingual poet in English and Urdu. He has worked extensively, published in, extensively, and uh, he is in key positions in different boards and also different organ, literary organizations. Over to Anishu Chibis. Sir. Your take on the book. Sir, you are muted. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sharingi. Uh, let me begin with a word of thanks to both of you, Dr. Sharingi and Dr. <coughs> Basudara. Because uh, this is a very special occasion, I would consider it to be very special. We really needed to connect. We have all been imprisoned within courts. Uh, quarantined, imprisoned, we haven't been out for a long time now. We needed, really needed to connect. This is a very happy occasion, happy also because we are going to celebrate poetry today. Poetry is our sakka today. And we, all of us who are here, <clears throat> have been studying poetry and writing poetry, and therefore people from all over the world have joined. It's a wonderful gathering, national and international. So a pleasure to be here, and I'm really going to enjoy this moment to listen to all of you. But since you have asked me to speak a few words, I would do that first. And then after that, I will be a very silent listener and I would be admiring the poems that would be read and also the discussion that will take place. So thank, thank you very much, both of you and everyone who has joined. <coughs> uh, if, uh, if you look at the, the uh, collection of this poem, uh, and uh, if you look at the scenario that we have today, in India, especially with reference to Indian poetry in English, uh, the situation is uh, very, very fascinating. I would say very fascinating. Uh, gone are the days when we often talked about influences. The poets do not write an influence under any kind of an influence now. They have got their independent voices, especially if you look at the scenario, the Indian English poetry scenario <clears throat> of the past two decades, more especially I have to underline that past two decades, and the number of anthologies that have appeared, both collected works as well as anthologies of individual poets, you would come across very confident voices. This is very unique in form and style and moving the poem the way the poem moves. The poem acquires its own identity, the Indian, typically Indian identity. The word, the stanza, the phrase, the image, the, 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 the metaphor, the symbol that has the poets have evolved during the past two decades, especially. This is a poem of confidence that we are writing today. Independent voices have emerged, voices of great merit have emerged. They are very intriguingly individual voices, typically Indian. 
Uh, I remember, I often recall <coughs> Pilal's uh, book uh, when he published that. I, I remember, if I remember right, during the 60s, late 60s, an anthology and a credo. That was the first important anthology that appeared from writer's workshop. And Pilal said at that point of time, there are a huge number of poets writing today. And someone said there are around 500 poets writing today. Well, it happens every time, even if you think of the present moment, there are more than 5,500 poets writing today. But how many voices rule, uh, really matter? That is very important for us to appreciate. In every age, in every place, in every location, literary location, literary habitat, we have lots of voices coming up. But the way India has distinguished itself, the Indian poets have distinguished itself as far as the English poetry is concerned, this is simply remarkable. That's why I said that one has to, to take these new voices into consideration. These are very independent voices and intriguingly individual, I often say. Uh, when I looked at this book and I found that there are three very important and very interesting blurbs that friends have written. K.K. Daruwala, uh, most uh, very eminent Indian poet, says that this is to be read by the first fireside in the winter. Very interesting poetic kind of an observation. Really so. If you go into the poems, you would realize that he is so true about saying so. Then Bashabi Frater says that uh, it's reminded her of the ghost binary of the home and the world. She thinks of home and the world in a very interesting manner since home is the crux of the matter. Home is the central point of reference. And home has been defined and redefined again and again in the poems, 52 poems that you have here. My friend DJV Prashad also has a very interesting point to make. He says that it thinks of the transactions of relationships. So the transactions of relations that will come across in this poet, in these poems. And uh, this also tells lots about these transactions of relationships. It is It operates at several levels. So it's a microcosm and at the macrocosm at both the levels, this transaction takes place. And that is how we have to take into consideration this new voice, Basudara's voice. Uh, Basudara published her first collection of poems, Moon in My Tea Cap, Tea Cup, which I read some time ago, and it was published in 2019. It contains 52 poems, and the book is dedicated to her father. Moving from there, three years later or so, she has come up with this, Stitching Home, 2021, and it contains 53 poems, one poem more than the last anthology. And interestingly, this is dedicated to her mother. Now, the first one to the father, than to the mother. So naturally, when the father and the mother are there, there is a home. It's very natural for any reader, for the poet herself to think of who are these fathers and mothers that we think of and how to connect with them. We connect with them through a space, an emotional space, and the space within the four walls and even outside that. So this is very interesting dedication, one after another, that I have come across and noticed. These 53 poems and then 52 poems, over 100 poems that we have in hand are enough material for us in hand to be able to read with interest and to evaluate the merit of her poetry. And in the preface of the first book, Basudhara says that the process emerged in chaotic, cathartic spaces. A very interesting phrase that she has used. Chaotic, cathartic spaces, this is how it started. And then she th thinks of the deep-rooted ex existential needs that this poem came out from. And then she says, poetry, she says, has been a rustle of the quieter moments later, she says. So in this preface, this is how she tries to look at her own poetry and the workshop, the, in, the individual workshop with which she develops and writes her poetry. But in the preface to the second book, she says that these are the poems of moments, poems of places, loves and loss, and discourses of home and homelessness. So if you look at both the anthologies taken together, you will find that there is a space that she wants to define for herself as also for the readers that we are. A space that is so very significant for inner poetry. In every poem, in every poet, a space is very important. But uh, she underlines it in a different manner. It becomes the central metaphor and the motif in her poetry. It becomes the central symbol in her poetry. And that is how she tr tries to develop a discourse on home and homelessness, home and home beyond. So that is how we look at this poem. And you see that this poem, as it emerges, as I look at it, I find that uh, that uh, uh, it it uh, it configures in different ways. As for example, it is home uh, with which she begins. It is an elusive space. And also sometimes it is very eerie and sometimes it's very real. Then sometimes it is very concrete and sometimes it is very abstract. Sometimes it's a figment of one's imagination and sometimes it's so very real and concrete. It, this home operates at several levels and from poem to poem as you move, not only the home that she thinks about, it's also the poetic craft that she thinks about that goes along with the poem. So the work that goes into the making of the poem 
and the process that goes into the making of the poem and the idea that operates through the poem are all taken together and that's how this book makes sense to me in a big way in a big way so there is emotional space these are the poems of emotional space i would like to call it the poems of emotional space and that is i would like to define the book then uh, i would it would appear to me that in the poems as we move from one to another one poem outlives the other and one poem enters into the another poem uh, another in the manner that enters into yet another poem and, and uh, i would just like to read a few lines from a book uh, from this book uh, which is there in my hand this is the new book which is which we are celebrating today so here in this book uh, if you look at uh, the last poem that she has here it makes great sense to me so i begin from the end of the book that is the last poem and i read first two stanzas here six lines three lines each a stitching a home she, she says how does one gather things unmindful of love the question mark how does one gather things unmindful of love things that is strayed so far alone they have no idea how to belong where does one fit the rusted keys of a house long soul it's wheezing now what marking your dreams i understand that this is the issue that the raises a point that she makes poems don't raise issues but here it appears that she lays the down for the poem to develop further which develops in the next in the, in the next four stanzas that we have where she says that the gunny bag is a home also we can learn from the home the idea of the home from that gunny bag <clears throat> she thinks of a place which is not a place which is not a home and yet a dream she thinks of the union of time and mind there of inhabitation of habitation the mud house and the leaking roof and the hand bicycle and the worn chap chor poi and the neem shade and all the moments that go along with it so starting from there if you go or move on with the, with the poems that you have in hand you have extension of this last poem in other poems of this volume like for example home truths on page 55 you have an extension of that idea of the discourse of the home then you have hunting for my poem it has a double edge it is a home as well as the poetic process that she develops in that poem then to home a house at page number 57 that also is an extension yet another extension i would say on the idea of the home and then undolling your house these are some of the very important poems that i have tried to mark out for you for the reader so that you can understand how there is a linkage that develops through the poems that one goes from now if you look at the qualities that her poetry uh say by the qualities that poetry can be recognized sensitivity of emotions is one thing which comes to my mind instantly and for that i would say that one has to read a poem like habits which is on page 78 that sensitive that very sensitive apprehension of the ideas or the experience that comes to mind then you have an imagistic tinge in a poem which comes uh, uh, which is a very interesting poem for me at least which is overlooking the cities from the railway coach it's on page number 18 and you would see that there's an image that flutters image after image as the train moves and you see from one stance from one to to another and you keep on layering layering The, the, the thoughts keep on layering the ideas keep on layering as the train moves and then this imagistic kind of a style develops into the poem it's a short poem but extremely sensitive to emotions and in the imagistic style there is a evolutionary process of a poem that she is engaged with which you can see in the poem called habits which is on page 78 of this poem and uh, poems overlooking the cities from the railway coach it goes along with that but the evolutionary of the process of the poem can be very well seen in a poem by meeting by choice which is a wonderful poem which i have personally liked a lot which is on page number 30 precision is an interesting poem which is which can be seen the precision precision of expression especially the quality that you often associate with poetry because poetry as 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 it is defined best words in the best order and if you have to look at that definition and to think of any poem from basudara's anthology you will find lost that is there i would especially refer to a poem which is very emotionally charged and which is very intense poem and this poem is called tomorrow it is on page number 26 and i would like to read this poem to you this poem tomorrow and i would like to read this poem to you because it immediately rang a bell in my mind and i would like to make a point here that how this really takes you from one language to another this poem tomorrow says when we meet next when we meet next i shall not know you having pawned by then this heart you could find no place for i will turn in the your presence will register no restlessness of glances of glances no quickening of breath 
no soaring of hope. You will flatten in my vision into mere acquaintance. Your significance drained from the simple from the pimple of my love. It isn't difficult if one does as fast over subtleties and can do away with me. Why I try to read this poem? Because I would like to read another poem side by side, which is by a the poet, and how you will see how the poem, two poems go together. This is a very important Urdu poet called Munir Niazi. And it appears as if both the poems go hand in hand together. Basutara's poem, which I have just read to you, and the poem by Munir Niazi, a very major poet of Urdu, modernist poet of Urdu, master of Nazm, as you can say, which is different from the Ghazal. This poem by Munir Niazi called Ab Mai Use Yaad Bana Dena Chahta Hun. And I'm reading this poem to you. And if you have time, you can compare the two poems. You listen to me, this Urdu one. Niazi says, Ab Mai Uski Aakho Mai Dekhta Rehta Hun. मगर मेरी समझ में कुछ नहीं आता मैं उसकी बातों को सुनता रहता हूं मगर मेरी समझ में कुछ नहीं आता अगर कभी वो मुझसे मिले तो मैं उससे बात नहीं करूंगा अगर कभी वो मुझसे मिले तो मैं उससे बात नहीं करूंगा उसकी तरफ देखूंगा भी नहीं मैं कोशिश करूंगा मेरा दिल कहीं और मुबतला हो जाए अब मैं उसे याद बना देना चाहता हूँ वो वेरी वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग the two poems go hand in hand together and uh, i really was when i read this poem i immediately recalled this munir niazi poem and i found how the two poets come together unknown to each other especially in times of in terms of time in terms of place in terms of age in terms of language but this is an essential human passion and see how the two poets have gone together to very clearly distinguish their emotions and to express themselves in such a such an exquisite manner so this poem that I have read um, uh, to you uh, called Tomorrow and May Abu Sayyad Bana Dena Chahatta, this tells lots about how poets really without any barriers that is there of language and of space and of time and of age, how the two poets girls got together. There are many such poems that remind me of other poets, but that doesn't think of influence, that doesn't take me to think of influence of the poem. If I have to go by my choices, and if I if I mention some of the poems which I personally liked a lot, Banaras is one of them. Both the poems of Banaras, that is Banaras 1 and Banaras 2. Overlooking cities from a railway coach, then tomorrow, and for a friend in a distant land, meeting by choice, hunting my poem, the right kind of woman, mother, door habits, post love. Lots of poems are here, 53 poems. I have enjoyed reading this anthology. I have thought about it a lot and I have read it along with the other books that I have received and I have bought and I have read uh, during the past uh, years of the new poets. And I very clearly and very certainly say this and with a with the amount of certain amount of confidence that Basudra's voice is going to stay on. I say this especially because uh, in the in the last 20 years, the two decades that we have had and the two decades that the poems that have been published and the anthology that have come from various platforms, from various, from various press publication houses, uh, not all of them are there that will stay. And that happens in every age that some of the poets make their place. I'm, I'm, I, I, I am of the opinion and, I, and I'm, I confirm my opinion. I again, again think of this that this is one voice which is going to stay on for good. Two anthologies of 100 poems. There's a great future line for the Sudhara, and she's going to really make it big. I have I have certain very uh, strong arguments in favor of saying so. And it's not because there is a celebration of this book that I'm saying this, but because I really believe that when I read her first anthology, that is Tom, uh, the Tika poem that is published by Writers Workshop, and then I looked at this poem three years later and the poems written during this period. I also seen how she has progressed in her art and how she has re-looked at her experience and how she has redefined herself. That is what a poet is like. A poet doesn't stay at one place and doesn't develop one stance. A poet keeps on developing. And one who doesn't develop and one who stays status in a state of stasis is on stead. In looking by looking at these two anthologies, I'm pretty sure that here is a poet who is trying to 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 move forward from one stance to another, from one style to another, and discovers both in terms of themes and style. Friends, I'm sorry if I have taken more time than I should have taken, but I thought that as much words, these many words, I should be taking speaking on this occasion. Thank you, Dr. Sorengi, for giving me this opportunity. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Anishoji. Thank you, Anishoji. Uh, uh, wonderful that you have so uh, elaborately explained our poems from emotional space to the poems 
uh, is a lot of future and promises and it, uh, the possibility of staying in the heart and will return to the collection and again and again. Thank you, uh, Nishwati. Uh, we move on to our one of our, another mentors, Professor Jijabi Prasad, former professor of English at Jawaharlal Nehru University, is known for, uh, as a poet, novelist, critic, translator, and academic administrator. And uh, continuities in Indian English poetry is one of the books that we always read first when we talk about Indian English poetry. Over to Jijabi, sir. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you uh, for giving me this lovely play opportunity again to speak to you all, and this particular specific opportunity for the in terms of the launch of the book of Basudaras, which is a really very good collection of poetry. And as uh, you know, people think I kind of do a lot of nakra uh, when people ask me to write blurbs. I say send me the manuscript. <laughs> let, me, let me look at the whole thing and I'll let you know if I'm going to write a blurb or not after that. <laughs> right. So when I write a blurb, it means I really, really like the book. I really like the man manuscript and I really want to uh, endorse it and to ask people to read. And sometimes they say stupid things like, this is a book meant to be read by all. You know, I mean it actually because I read it and I like it so much. And I want people to, it's not simply a blurb written because a publisher asked me or a poet asked me. My blurbs are all from the heart. And I write from the heart for people whose work speaks to me from their heart or speaks to my heart. I don't know whether it speaks from their heart, but definitely speaks to my heart. And especially when I'm looking at poetry and fiction, it's something that must appeal to me, that must speak to me, must address some of my own experiences, uh, must make me think differently about certain things and make provoke me to rethinking about certain things. And Basudra does all that. This collection of poetry does all that. It makes you, it provokes you, it makes you think about your own experiences, not just about her poetry. Her poetry triggers things in you. And and I, I wrote I wrote a blurb, a longish blurb. So I, I, I kind of think uh, that I've said almost everything that I want to say in a very terse manner of that, in that very briefly. And Anis today has said everything I wanted to say at length because I loved his introduction. I'm glad he's spoken this because he's freed us from saying things because, uh, you know, he, he said it. And all I need to do is to uh, uh, reiterate that Basudra is a very significant voice. Her poems are brilliantly crafted, but the craft is not everything. They speak to you. They speak to you. They the, the, what she talks about and the way she talks about it come together to make you think about, as I said, relationships in this collection, relationships about the idea of home, about the idea of that this is the moments, significant moments together. How you make your life, how you remember your life, how do you construct your life? And this in terms of metaphor of home, because after all, for all of us, that in terms of relationships, in terms of people and things we do, and Basudara gets all that perfectly right, including say, you know, things we know, but the way she says it, that home is actually sometimes another person, not a place, but a person. Right before that, where she says home is you, right? And it's in, in you know the, the way she uh, addresses these notions of home and how home travels with you, how home always travels with you. Your ideas of home travel with you. They are then associated with other homes that, that you may inhibit. And home is also a sense of loss, that what you lose, even things you lose, even material objects you lose, one thing, home is always not with you as well. Home and home, to be home at home and to be homeless are two sides of the same coin. And Basudra, as I said, it's in poetry that you can do this. And Basudra does this so beautifully in her poetry. 
I had done something which I uh, normally don't do. I was I had decided this morning that I was going to read a number of our poems, and I started putting sticky tapes and um, the notes, right? And then I realized almost every poem I was actually saying, I'm going to read this, I'm going to read this. It turned out to be I want to read every poem of hers. And I said, this is ridiculous. I took it all out and said, if, I was, if there was one poem in this, which one would I read? And I went to this, right to the middle of the book, Home Truths. I'm not going to read it out to you. So Basudra, don't worry. I'm not going to spoil your poem for you. But I'm going to read a few lines, Home Truths. A home is obvious, inevitable. It is contingent, dispensable. A home is what you seek, never find. It is where you're forced to return each night. A home is a permanent address. It is always meant to be lost. It rests on the whims of others. It can be burnt, vandalized, robbed. A home is a theorem. It is conjecture. A home is arrived at like a syllogism. It is a fallacy, continuously deferred. A home is a signify. It is an aporia. I said, I will not read the entire poem. And I merely read, finished it. So let me, let me read the entire poem. A home is concrete. Name, place, animal, thing. It is only abstract. Enjambment, fiction, an apostrophe is wet dream. <laughs> Such humor such living in paradoxes, such a realization that home is and isn't, that you whether you are home or you aren't, moment, it depends on the moment, depends on the world that you're inhibiting at that point of time in terms of experience. What is happening to you is what makes you feel at home or not at home. That home could be anywhere, everywhere, and nowhere. You know, this, this speaks to you. Basudra's poetry speaks to you in ways she may not even have meant because how does she know what we have experienced, right? And she may think this is completely gendered poetry. And of course, she's speaking as herself, but it speaks to me completely. And I can identify with a lot of her poetry. And I'm thinking of this in very many ways because so many times we are told that you cannot appropriate other people's experiences, that you can only speak for yourself, that you can only speak for your family, your community, etc, etc. And it's big in academia uh, that you can't speak for others. And yet I feel when I read Basudra, that damn it, not only can I appropriate her experiences, she's speaking for me. She's the other way around. When I read her, she's speaking for me. And this is what I think always I feel good literature does, good poetry does, good fiction does. So. I'm happy to speak at this launch. I'm happy to introduce Basudara's poetry in case you don't know it. If you do know it, I'm happy to endorse along with you that we have a major voice here. Thank you, Basudra, for the poetry. And thank you, Jaideep and Basudra, for the opportunity. Thank you, Jijay Vipasad, sir. It's uh, tempting. And uh, reading Basudara is, is uh, creating hunger in us that we will read more of Basudara in the near future. Thank you. Jijibi sir for your continuous support and uh, uh, inspiration for poets who will be publishing poetry and living with poetry in the days to come. Uh, we uh, pass on to uh, Shangjuktadi, our own Shangjuktadi. Uh, she needs no introduction. And yesterday evening we were together for Usha, we are an evening with Usha Akela and with Malash Rilal, Professor Malash Rilal. We had a different kind of flavor of poetry, so we can easily understand. And uh, Shangjuktadi needs no introduction, professor and former head department of English and former dean, faculty of arts, University of Calcutta, a noted poet, uh, starting with Snapshot 1997 to Sita Sisters, 2019. And uh, she is uh, now uh, the president of uh, ICE, uh, IPPL, Intercultural Poetry and Performance Library, which is one of the happening poetry places in the country. Over to Shanghutadi on Bashukara's poetry collection. Yeah. Hello, everyone. And thank you, Jaideep. And thank you, Boshidara, for this opportunity. It was a joy to receive the hard copy of your book. 
and go through the poems and also through the fantastic blurbs. And also right now, uh, Anisur Rahman's excellent review of the book. It was a complete review. And uh, of course, G.J. V. Uh, Prasad's reading of the book and also telling us that Basudhara is the new star in the poetic horizon, a major poet. And Anisur also said that. So we are really, really very happy to be here this morning to celebrate very good poetry and poetry from the heart and poetry from the mind as well. So congratulations, Vasudhara, for stitching a home, your fabulous second book of immensely absorbing poems that touches both the mind and the heart, resonating with sense and sensibility. The first thing that struck me about Basudhara's book was a striking title. For me, it is a gendered title on many levels. It does not make me think of those microeconomic warning phrases, a stitch in time saves nine. Remember those Victorian caveats, yes? And instead, by using the transitive verb stitching, it deconstructs gender stereotypes. It suggests how remarkably women have traveled a long way and busted countless ceilings. The title flags the emergence of the 21st century multitasking women who are at ease both at home and in the public domain. Educated professional women no longer just sit at home and sew and stitch in the dim light of the midnight lamp. Now they can stitch wounds. They can stitch and sew cloth. They can stitch a home as they can stitch their classrooms and workplaces. For such multitasking women, every day is an assertion of emotional intelligence and empathy skillfully combining mending, repairing, and joining to keep the challenging spaces of home and workplace together in close bonding and binding. This micromanaging of home has one super active space. I'm sure you're like guessing. And that is the food factory where raw materials are transformed into edible products. If Basudara permits me, I would like to conclude by reading her poem about bonding with kitchen activities. With so much of love, grace, understanding, care, trust, youthful energy, sincerity, and spontaneity. In fact, these features are present in varied combinations in all the poems in this volume. And that is why we respond so positively with so much of excitement and enthusiasm to all the poems of Boshudhara in this particular volume. So the kitchen poem is the one I would like to read. And uh, for us, it is just a little after breakfast, but it is suggesting a little more serious food like the one you have on a Sunday lunch. It's called Dampukht. And she uh, also gives us virtually the recipe. How do you cook vegetables, you ask, as you observe the round edges of my potatoes, carrots, cauliflowers, and tenderly urge peas nestled within. Like you, I answer, except that I do not hurry them at all. In a generous pan, I like them to talk to one another, to melt their stubborn pride like butter till they give way. So a generous pan, not one of those hot fiery pans. Yes, so see the use of uh, signifiers and lose distinctness of shape, texture, color, and impart ungrudgingly their best to the company. I like vegetables to reach out for others over steady heat. To know, though different, they are all in this together. To find love in dissolution. 
and realize life begins with belonging and ends there too. I do not know. I have limited uh, reading experience, I would uh, like to confess, but I cannot remember a single kitchen poem that covers so much of space. Thank you so much, Bashudara. Thank you, Jayadeep. Was looking forward to the readings. Thank you. Thank you, Shankar. These wonderful connections to food and poetry, Bashudara. And I think it touches so much, and we feel hungry of eating her poems like breakfast, after afternoon meals, and of course, dinner. Thank you, Shankar. Now, no book is complete without the publisher. Here we have Dimpajati Sharma. And uh, Dipachati, the stage is yours. You are a poet yours by yourself. So a poet publisher means a lot. What's your take on the book? Over to Dipachati. Hi, hi. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not a... Uh, I think the publisher should not speak on occasions like that. Because whatever... I could about the book. I've done, done it with the book. You have the books in your hands. So whatever I could do, it is already before you. Uh, I think like, you know, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm proud to have worked with Basuda and proud to have published this book because yeah, she is a voice to be looked out for as uh, many of you have already suggested. I think that's it. We work hard on this book. What I can say is that we work hard on this book for nearly a year. And I would like to comment on Basuda for the fact that we see a lot of young poets who are very confident of their craft in a sense like, you know, okay, this is what I believe in. This is how I'm going to write. But in the case of, uh, in Basuda's case, like we had a lot of to and fro in the editing process and she was always amiable we could negotiate what we are going to do what we are not going to do and uh, i think it worked well and the end result is we have a wonderful book in our hands thank you thank you Dipachati, and uh, more strength to your publishing house because it's wonderful production as well and uh, now you. we'll we we'll listen to the poet reciting a couple of uh, poems over to Vashudara. Thank you. I am very overwhelmed, as all of you can understand. I do not have words to uh, thank all the wonderful things that I have heard today. And I, it, it, it is taking me time to believe they're all said about me. They're all said about what I have written. So, And I am extremely grateful that we had three critics who could, uh, you know, look at the book in a compound way that I actually wanted because uh, poetry is never about arriving at where you wanted to go. It is always a process. It's always a journey. And each step that you take, you want to be kind of uh, encouraged that, yes, you're doing it right. So uh, that is how uh, children learn, children grow by through reinforcement. You tell them that, yes, you're doing it right and you are arriving where you want to go. And that is, I think, there could be uh, no better, uh, you know, uh, this was a dream encouragement for me. And uh, Sanjukta Adi, I wanted to thank you for your, you know, feminist reading, because this is exactly what I have wanted to, uh, you know, I have wanted to be read this way. And uh, I wanted Moon also to be read this way, because I believe that uh, I am also speaking for my space, for people like me who inhabit this space. And there is poetry here too. So uh, poetry can be found anywhere if we are trying to look hard enough. And that happens to be one of my favorite poems uh, in the collection. And uh, it was rejected three or four times when I tried to submit it for places. But I think that today you choosing that out to read uh, gives me everything. It gives me everything. I can just say that I am extremely grateful, you know, when I got the gloves that I wanted to get, uh, when all the three people whom I approached uh, responded to me, GJ Visa is here, and I was very, very uncertain. And I told him that you need not give me a blurb if you think it is not worth it, uh, only if you think it is worth it. And I was so anxious whether he's going to write one for me or not. So see, we are.
Vasudhara, you are muted. Vasudhara, muted. Oh, oh, yes. I'm so sorry. In my excitement, I'm muting myself. Uh, okay. So uh, I can just I can just say that uh, I am. Uh, I do not know. I do not. I have never experienced this before, so I do not have the words to say what I'm feeling at the moment. But I am just. I just feel that I can say objectively about the book that the book is extremely grateful to have received such love, such valued readings. And uh, thank you, thank you very much. I'll just begin with uh, maybe the poem that everyone likes, uh, the first poem, Banaras. And I think I will read that. So uh, Banaras 1, returning to an old city long left behind is like coming back to children who have grown through time and unfurled while you were away, stumbled upon secrets, developed appetites, loathings, impulses. Nursed dreams, hurts, wounds, prejudices. Or it is like returning in love to a beloved, long estranged, whose face, though changed, bears yet unerased marks of longing once deeply felt. Of assurances given, promises made. Returning to an old city is knowing you had a heart once younger, that bet differently. It is realizing that meaning will always exist in palimpsest, in encounters unforgotten, in loves unconfessed. Returning to your old city is an awakening to loss unaccounted for, a restoration to forms best known amidst hazes, a surrender to the tender stillness in the heart of chaos, where the hopes come undone, odes to pasts may still be sung. Thank you. I think I will look forward now to the reading session and read just this because so many of the poems that I loved from the book have been read. And I thank Anisur sir for, you know, doing that comparison, uh, you know, because uh, it always makes poetry more fertile when you look at it through another poem. So a poem looked at through another poem and uh, especially when it is, uh, you know, when it is in another language, in another context. And Anisur sir did that beautiful comparison. Thank you so much uh, for uh, you know bringing that today. So, uh, can we move over to the reading session, Jadeep sir? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, reading really, session. Thank you. And we, have, yeah. we have a wonderful lineup of poets today who have uh, kindly agreed to be here and to read. And we begin with Zual Tepunte, who is an associate yeah. professor in English at Aswal. She enjoys photography, creative writing, has been running a blog called Miso Writing in English since 2007. She is especially interested in promoting the writings of young Miso writers in English because she feels that writers in English from the Miso community are marginalized and unappreciated. We are so grateful that she is with us here today and over to her for Thank you so much, Basudara and uh, everyone. I have actually never attended this sort of meeting before. Um, so this is very new to me. Um, and I'm going to read firstly a poem that I wrote just recently, just uh, last week. Uh, this is not exactly in keeping with, you know, the spirit of this meeting here, because this is about COVID. Anyway, so let me read it. Lockdown, COVID 2.0. I am slowly beginning to forget the pleasure of waking up in the morning, anticipating what the day might bring. One locked in day after the other, pacing within these four walls, classes over Zoom, attempting to reach when few students behind computer screens. In these hills too, the second wave is harsher. Statistics surge every day, nudging at five figures. Ambulances cream under cover of the night, ferrying the infected to safe places. And patients wheeled into the ICU do not all leave upright anymore. But life here is kinder than in the plains. There, it is a nightmare come alive. Swollen bodies floating in rivers, washed up on embankments for stray dogs to feed on. A desperate sister's calls 
of biology, wake up, biology, echo in the air. As the summer sun mingles with smoke and fire from funeral pyres, people gasping for breath and finding no hospital beds dying on roadsides. I feel a sense of survivor's guilt. But these lockdown mornings are so unendingly empty. Okay, now my second poem. Uh, this is called October. I wrote this last October. And this is to be published in an anthology of women's writings from Mizoram uh, to be published by Zuban. So October. And suddenly it's October again. The dank, dark, damp will soon be gone with the slush and wet. Shadows will lengthen in the angled sunlight. We shall warm our backs too on chilly mornings when winter sets in. Morning pools of cotton wool, white wreath across valleys and mountains. Blue skies piled with immense white clouds. Evenings that explode with color. Brown confetti from the Golmoha tree long past its May days of glory. The dry and dust bring back childhood memories, riding homeward from sun-baked plains, up cool, winding highland roads, the nuns at boarding school left far behind. Father wrapping a warm arm around one of us. Home to mother and the dear little house at the top of the dusty hill. Seasons, sorry, season changes, warm out memories buried in time. And the more things change, the more things remain the same. Thank you. Thank you for those very beautiful poems. And uh, no, you said that, you know, they are not part of the context. They are very much part of the context. We cannot ignore what is happening all around us. And very beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing them with us. Uh, we move on. I, I wonder if she's here right now. Do we have Vinita Agarwal here? Do we have Vinita Agarwal? So hard. Uh, see. Yes, I think. I think she is out. Okay, she'll be back. Maybe. Yes, we can. We can then uh, maybe move on to Sanjukta Di, and we can come back uh, to Vinita when she comes. Uh, Sanjukta Di, she has already been introduced, and yet I would like to say a couple of lines about her. She's professor and former head. Uh, Department of English and former Dean Faculty of Arts, University of Calcutta. She's a poet, critic, translator, and above all, she is a feminist writer who inspires us in this journey towards uh, being women and towards thinking as women. So, Sanjuk Dadi, thank you. Thank you for uh, sharing and agreeing to share your beautiful poems. Over to you. Thank you for that very warm introduction again, uh, Bashudhara. Uh, though I had suggested that I should be reading your poems today, but since I have read one, I will try to share two of mine. Now, these were published um, in an anthology of what is known as COVID poems. And when this book was published from dusk to dawn, and uh, Anisur is also very much a part of this book, uh, we thought, well, we have written everything. COVID is something that we are going to think about as one of those dreadful moments in our own life's history and, and the collective history of the world. And then it springs back. Yes. And I'm not going to read the more bitter uh, spring back poems because I do not want to spoil this morning by referring to floating dead bodies on the Ganga waters. I will read two poems from the earlier one. One is a little bit of a uh, overburdened with too many words because probably I was rather annoyed. This one is called Annus Horribilis. 
where have all the fighter planes gone? Where are the bazookas and drones, those intercontinental ballistic miss missiles, the grenade launchers and magnum guns? Where are the shells that split open the hearts and heads of the targets? Where are the sniper rifles and the F-15E strike eagles? Where, where lurks the remote controlled devils of death? The world's armory of humankind killers now rusts and gathers dust. An invincible, invincible, invisible microvirus now holds us hostage with its incredible might. This infiltrator is not an extraterrestrial monster. It is neither a suicide bomber nor a hired terrorist. Glowing in a lethal corona halo, it is a hide and spring champion, a novel, malignant, menacing microvirus. Can we forgive it, for it does not know what it is doing? Our post-truth world, where fake news rules, where pricks of conscience seem like absurd romantic rash and mushy sentiment, our world of credit cards and debit cards. I shop, therefore I am. Our global mantra, endlessly chanted in Instagram and videos, selfies, texts, posts, and deafening tweets. Baffled, the philosophic coronavirus reflects. So they need to die to wake up? So that's the first poem. Thank you. And this poem I read yesterday, but I think I will read this poem. Uh, this is one that Professor Induna Choudhury, uh, sort of introducing me to uh, the editors of this book, thought that he would refer to. And it's about the Bengali New Year, which is the month of April, which again starts from the middle of April, 15th April to the 15th of May. And today we are into a new month, which is called Joishto, the earlier month, the one which is celebrated all over India as the New Year, the Indian New Year, not the Gregorian calendar. This is O Boishak. Purge and purify the ailing earth. Let the fierce blazing sun scorch the demons of death. Boishak, I am rooted in a graveyard. Cardboard coffins lie everywhere. Even the grave diggers have gone. Bodies rot as crematoriums are few. Too many are suddenly falling asleep. Too many are leaving too soon. Pangs of hunger make them writhe and beg. Too many migrant feet trudge in search of home. Hunger haunts the ghostly towns and villages, sleepless in cities as ghastly processions gasp in breathless agony everywhere. Nightmares ride like the furies. The echoes scream and scare each other. The violent, virulent virus goes viral. Can an invisible, blind, deaf, and dumb droplet of death be the monarch of all its surveys? Karuna, compassion. Karuna, compassion. Karuna. Chant the healing, cleansing raindrops as they fall and a pristine new year of hope is born. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjuk Dadi, for the very powerful poems. And particularly, the second one resonates so strongly uh, with all of us, I hope. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we move to Rob, Rob Hale, who's a poet, artist, and reviewer from Australia. His work has been published in several journals, anthologies. He's on the editorial board of a number of international art and literary journals, including Leonardo. His work is mainly concerned with the techno metamorphosis of humanity. And uh, over to you, Rob, for your lovely poems. Well, thank you. 
Uh, firstly, I'd like to congratulate you on your wonderful book. Uh, I've just finished reading it and I've just finished writing the review. You uh, asked me if I'd review. Uh, I probably didn't have to do that because the first four speakers have absolutely captured everything that I said in my review. Congratulations to all of you speakers as well. It's, you've absolutely nailed this book and it, tr it truly is a wonderful book. So uh, I'll send you that review or send that review for publication fairly shortly. Um, I'll just read two poems of mine today. Um, the first one's actually about politicians. Uh, it's called Betrayal. Baptismal fonts decay and information structures breed like alien dictators. Fat rubber stamps rot slowly as the assumption of integrity collapses under hypocrisy's vengeance. Force the young to live in gutters, squats and cardboard cutouts. Build your national empire's grand, which rests on stumps of misery. Your status rises temporarily with every option to oppress. The young who only want a chance share the air and blood that's yours. Uh, even more, they trust you with their care, just like Judas you betrayed. Not once, not twice, but your enshrinement in the chamber perfects a continual betrayal of lies and graft and horror. Even as you drown your mind and whiskey spills across your soul, you can't escape the burden of their hope. Counselors of heavy hype and hail, empty, heartless, barren, your life is a useless farce if you sleep warm and weightless when your children cower and freeze in the sewer of your mind. Thank you. Sorry for it being a bit heavy, but uh, that's the way it is. This one, uh, footprints. Scaling the crumbling cliff of destiny, I turn and let my eye fall down, down to the valley floor. Footprints disappear, filling with dust of barrenness, echoed unmistakably in shades of strictures far too harsh. Every advance eroded, Every move to imprint upon the path, a permanence, is swept away unnoticed. Reflecting, resting on a ledge, the hardness of my granite loft belies enduring limitations. Decaying basalt strewn across a face of life intimidates mortality, and the fault line of life and death narrows to a slit, a fractured fold. Higher now, the valley fading, obscured by veils of mist, Temptation to dissolve into the misty lessens with each weathered rock, and mellowness betrays the ageing. But all too soon, I'll reach out gladly to touch the rising moon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for bringing so much diversity into the gathering with those beautiful poems, uh, the political edged one particularly. Thank you so much. Uh, and we move over to uh, Richard Grove, or Thai, who is a poet, editor, publisher, photographer, and president of the Canada Cuba Literary Alliance. He is the Poet Laureate of Brighton, Ontario, and has 20 titles of poetry, fiction, and memoir to his credit. He's a literary consultant of ACC Shanghai, uh, Hufing Literature, and the editor-in-chief of Devour Art and Literature a magazine from Canada. And he is most importantly up at 1.30 a.m. at his end today just to be with us. And this generosity is beyond words. Thank you, Tai, for, you know, for pulling through this. Thank you. Over to you for your poems. You are muted. You have to unmute, Tai. There we go. Yes. The, 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 the magic um, unmute button. Uh, my wife wishes that she had a mute button for me sometimes. But um, uh, thank you, thank you so much for um, the uh, the kind introduction. I'm so pleased to be here um, in Canada and um, zooming in with you. Um, it was a joy to to read um, Basudara's um, uh, poetry book. Um, I wrote a, um, a two-page um, review, and I'm just going to read a, 
uh, one small paragraph at, from the end of the review, and that is um, Dr. Bazadara Roy will take you deep into the heart of home by stitching poems with multicolored threads. Do not expect to read this collection in one sitting. Ponder the tapestry presented one poem at a time. If you gaze upon stitching a home slowly, poem by poem, you will not be disappointed, disappointed by what is woven for your ponderance. End of quote. These are existential poems of place and moments in place. I know Basu as a dear friend, as a sensitive, caring individual, and it is a and it is reflected in her poems. It was a, a joy to read her book. And I look forward to getting my hands on a hard copy and um, reading them all again. Thank you so much. I'm going to um, read a couple of poems. The, um, the first poem, um, of course, we all know who um, Rumi is. Um, he's a 13th century uh, Persian poet. I borrowed a line from his poem, The New Rule. The line that I borrowed is, is I took it as a sign to start singing, and it became the title of my poem. I took it as a sign to start singing. Last night, the full moon floated in the fullness of my cool lakeview horizon. My skipped pebble rippled across star-filled sky. I took it as a sign to start singing from my joy-filled heart. This next poem, I like to, um, when I'm reading with our um, um, Indian friends, I like to make reference to our uh, temperature because even today, um, a beautiful spring day, we had um, almost 20 degree temperature, but now it's uh, nighttime and it has uh, plummeted to um, just under 10 degrees. Um, Celsius. So this poem uh, makes reference to temperature. Morning comes with its slanting light. We had our first frost of the season last night. It dropped from a glorious plus 12 degrees Celsius to minus 11 within hours. It was the start of our journey past the rising full moon to black-armed naked branches, rustling leaves in tall gray grass. We are now past the first snowfall and have arrived at the moment of now, waiting, watching the drifting dull of winter that keeps on coming. We hear the chattering ice-lined waves that never stop on our journey to the now of forever in the slanting light of morning. Thank you so much, and thank you so much for having me. And Hi. congratulations. Thank you so much for being here and for sacrificing on sleep for that. Thank you. And uh, thank you for your beautiful poems. We move over to Jharna, Jharna Chaudhuri, who is joining us from the Northeast. And Jharna Chaudhuri loops words and threads together to recreate her lost home, 
the Silsaku wetland of Guwahati, Assam. Her creative writings have been featured in the News India, the Little Journal of Northeast India, Spillwords, a collection titled Unsent Letters from the South Asian Diaspora, and are forthcoming in four anthologies of poetry and memoir. We are so grateful to have Jharna with us to share her lovely poems. Over to you, Jharna. Thank you. Thank you, Vasantharadvi, and I congratulate you uh, for the book. And uh, the idea of stitching and home both are so intricately related to me because I embroider and I am trying to, you know, uh, be a part of the embroidery artist community. So, um, and home again is very important to me. So I'll be sharing a poem, which is about the dead wetland of Guwahati called Silsako. Uh, the title of the poem is of flying Hayakins and Monet. Those are my grandmother's eyes floating on Silsako's purple patch. These water lilies, I have seen them before, flying with Hayakins, escaping the turbulence of Mars wicker Khaloi, pacing the needles of Kaui fishes in thick mud, and letting the sky in once in a while, like her hair parted by the wind rightly. Why green smells like naphthalene balls to me has an answer folded in Mars Mekhela, now lost in the waves of one huddled wetland packed tightly in a box of bricks. People die, places die too. Salsako, you are shreds from her golden sari. The printed buds have blossomed now in pink. You are my canvas. You are Monet's. Thank you. My second poem is about the feeling uh, of home as claustrophobia that I want to perfect. This poem is titled, My Mother is a Pickle Jar. My mother is a pickle jar. One night I found the lid open and did not dare to close my mother's body. I overheard, ha ha Ju, there are ways of savoring her. She's instant food, instant love homegrown with a shelf life. Curiously, I looked closer day after day and found her mole floated in search of her face. She became a contortionist with tangy skin. Her limbs penetrated, her breast disintegrated in salt. My mother is a pickle jar. She makes me think in my sleep if love is edible, she demonstrates the technique of storing in such a small space her crumbling body wanting me to stare and stare and distinguish where is where and what is what and how. Thank you. Thank you for the very, very evocative poetry, Jarna. And um, we move over to Nanana, the GJ Visa himself who is a former professor of English at JNU. He is a poet, novelist, translator, and uh, he is one of the critics who, you know, uh, I think all of us have always followed. And he sets the critical tones uh, for almost all genres of uh, literature and Indian English literature in particular. So over to you, GJ Visa, for your wonderful poems. Thank you. Thank you for your very, very kind words, uh, which I now feel I don't deserve at all. Uh, I said that uh, actually today is Masudara your day. I read a poem of yours. I feel like reading more poems of yours out. Uh, but since you said I should read mine, I'll read just two, one a very old one uh, and one a new one, neither of which I have ever read out before. So I don't even know how they sound. Right. So the first one is called Dynasty. Our father could only repair the ancestral house his brothers grudged him in a place where none of the family lived nor does in a one in a one car town of no rent. His plot of gold in Delhi he couldn't mine and gave my brother whose loan cannot meet the cost of his dream that I envy. So that's the a very old poem and as i said i never read it before and uh, always 
draw smiles when I when people in my family read it, when my extended family read it, they recognize what I'm talking about. Uh, the second one I wrote recently, it's called Just Reality. And will you marry her and make her an honest woman? Asked the judge of the rapist. She felt violated all over again. The judge, judge felt no remorse. After all, rape was allowed in marriage and he could do what he wanted and she had the position of a wife. Win, win all around. Humanity drowned in blood, torn to shreds by barbarity. No, said the rapist lawyer. My lord, now it would be bigamy or bigamy. He would have loved to marry her then. He would have loved to marry her then. Now he's a married man with children. How can he marry his prey of earlier times? Yes, thought the judge. He has another woman now to rape. This is fate, young woman. You were at the wrong place at the wrong time. You tempted him too early in his life. A little later, and you could have been his wife. He's a respectable man. Won't it be best to reach a settlement? Make him pay, he said, and laughed at his own joke. Thank you. Very, very powerful poems. I'm glad you chose to read them, GJ Visa. And there are, I think, everyone has goosebumps right now, hearing particularly the second piece. Thank you so much for sharing this here today. And I, I will uh, hand this over to Jadeep sir to invite our other poets. From New Delhi to Australia, Emily Collier lives in Australia. She is a writer, she is a poet, and uh, she, uh, she writes prose and plays. And she is very much into uh, with the critical uh, uh, evaluation of uh, literature. And she is now guested in the Dista Review Poetry Journal to be published very soon. And she is an important member of text a leading journal from Australia. Over to Emily for your poems. Over to Emily. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jadeep. Thank you, Basudara. I'm really honoured to be invited to be here today. It's been amazing listening to all of these poems. I feel very, very humbled. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm speaking to you today as I'm in Australia. I'm currently on Darug and Gandangara land, uh, which is away from my normal home. I'm normally down in Victoria on Wurundjeri land, but I'm, I'm in the Blue Mountains right now. Um, just amazing that we're all here from different parts of the world. So I have two poems to share. Um, they both speak to home in maybe fairly um, abstract ways, but hopefully that speak to the themes of today. And it's been wonderful to hear so many different kinds of poetry and different um, tones and themes. So I hope to contribute in a small way to that. Uh, so my first poem is called Everyday Antigone. Antigone is in every kitchen, ordinary daylight bravery, autumn leaf suburbs and brutalist housing towers. She's wearing new pink kicks, dragging on a cotton pill sweater, mundane domestic, the room with knives, an oven, a sunken silver hole shaped like a cradle. Echoes of all the kitchens that came before. Dad's done something rotten, a sister in another room who's neither violent nor erotic, surviving her own unhappiness. On this ordinary day, all the Antigones stand up in their dry mouth way against a slapstick joke, a sweaty hand, a gun held by an invisible man. They each stand with grumbling stomachs, coffee breath, toast crumbs in their toothbrushes. They open their mouths, these everyday Antigones. Rise, felled, speak, silenced. And nobody makes a big deal of what happens, her body not meat enough to feed the new cycle machine. Maybe a heartsick mother or friend who wonders at the end of the day why the kitchen is so empty. Dishes silent, lights on, waiting for every Antigone to get home safe, for all of her stories to be told. And the second poem I'll read today is uh, called Before the End. In the park early morning, quiet pale grass, 
and trees singing a symphony. Small with a sweet song, it could be a brown thornbill native to this area or house sparrows, an introduced species. Picture them flutter wing in cages, months on ocean hungry ships. Do birds get seasick? Now a pest, no amount of effort will exterminate them. Three planes drag bass notes through the flight path overhead. What do birds make of them? Watch out for the big howling ones. Neologisms proliferate. Snarge, a word coined for what is left of birds when they fly into propellers. Now a shorthand for all the accidental ways humans kill animals. The period post baby boom is called the great acceleration. We are racing breathless towards the finish line. Walk slow to the dawn lit park, stop at the singing tree, feet planted, face raised, hope to see birds before the day begins. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful Emily, wonderful poems. Thank you so much for joining us from Australia. Thank you for being part of uh, Indian journals as well on behalf of this, uh, thank you. Okay. Now, uh, we move on from Australia to uh, Tunisia. Bethania Mazal uh, is currently Associate Professor of English in Tunisian University. She specializes world literature, comparative literature, film studies, cultural poetics, emotional intelligence, digital communication, and feminist literature. Over to Bethania. Thank you, Jadip. Thank you so much. I would like to thank you and Basudara for this uh, amazing event. It's always a pleasure being uh, with you. Um, Basudara made us aware that poetry is uh, what uh, we call it home. I'm quoting her. It is like uh, a water to thirst. I'm using her words. Thank you, Basudara, for this womb of words yet secrets, uh, which is one of the titles of your poems. Uh, poetry and the sun, and I'm waking up very early this morning, and thank you for uh, allowing me to do so. Um, they take us back to the light and take us to other galaxies and because poetry is life and it is about life uh, I will share these two poems I wrote long ago and went back to them uh, when I received this invitation the first one is blundering in the darkness the sun shines outside but seems to glow on the wrong side the room is empty and the curtains are down there's such a heat outside the lights are shot inside why not get out to the light bright right is the light the dirty mind cannot survive the fight excruciating feelings of fear mingled with the ghosts of the silent night though the door is open and the day has come the blinded heart continues blundering in the darkness unable to reinforce the thoughts, continues into the flow of sightless. Suddenly, the blowing wind penetrated the room and the locked soul exorcised the shining moon. The glittering stars illuminated the sky. The clean air gently opened the window and the lost soul tempted to fly. Even if all the evils do die, Liberate the owl, the crow, and cry, no matter who, when, where, or why, no witch in the gloom could ever change the doom. Uh, thank you. The second poem is a shorter Fortuna. Fortuna means luck. Blinded by love, veiled goddess of luck, generous heart fallen apart for all art. Capricious times, melodies and rhymes, sounds of chimes. Doubtful destinies, face your enemies, call your fairies. Change is inside, in a pride 
cannot be denied. Dream and scream, goddess Fortuna, bring my Luna. Too much ado. Stop that bravado. Fortuna is only for the desperado. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Britannia, for wonderful, wonderful, very touching poems. Thank you. Thank you. It's very early in the morning. Thank you. Very happy day. Uh, from Tunisia to Latin America, El Salvador, but Ario seems to be not present today. Maybe two all the time, he couldn't. Uh, this uh, old time of uh, the night, late night in El Salvador. So we pass on to Anisurgis again. So please do of your points. We're all waiting. You are mute. Thank you, Yodip. Uh, this is a collection of poems from which uh, Sanjukta has also read, and this is a collection of poems on COVID. So I'll be reading two poems. One is from there. And the other book is uh, the other poems from another book. Uh, this is uh, titled as uh, Galen, Sina, Shushruta. These are three great physicians from three different traditions. And they're also the philosophers of medicine and theorists of medicine. Galen, Sina, and Shushruta. Galen, you listen to Hippocrates. The Platonist, the Aristotelians, the Stoics. You made us believe medicine was science, art, and one. You made us believe health was body, mind, soul, country. We listened to you for ages, over ages, over ages, proving, disproving you. <clears throat> Ibn Sina, you listened to Galen and all. You made us believe it was dirt, breath, water. You made us believe it was germ, germ indeed, germ, germ indeed, that drove us ill. We listened to you for ages, over ages, over ages. Proving, disproving you. So, Shruta, you listened to yourself. You made us believe it was the contact, none else but the contact. You made us believe, abstain, abstain, abstain. From touching, tasting, meeting, sitting together. We listened to you for ages, over ages, over ages. Proving, disproving you. Last stanza, Galen, Ibn Sina, Shushruta. Thank you all so very much. We maintain the body, mind, soul, temperature. We keep the germs, germs away. We stay in seclusion. Yet we often breach the temperature, carry the germ to touch and taste and fret and few and live together separately. There is another poem which I am going to read out to you. This is from my collection called Earthenware. <coughs> this is a very short one. Uh, the title is, He Never Raised His Index Finger. It is, a political, it is a political poem purely. He never raised his index finger except for accusing. He never raised his index finger except for accusing. All other fingers, quiet in tutelage, thought of making a fist. The thought of making a fist to trap the index finger. Even trapped, the index finger sat over the fist to rule. So the three fingers and the thumb looked at each other in whispers. In whispers, they decided to live at peace with the index finger. Thank you. And uh, uh, just a minute before that, uh, Joydeep, uh, the very interesting point that Sanjukta made about uh, that uh, fam uh, that gendered angle in the title. That was one point I was going to emphasize, but I thought I was crossing the limit of my time, so I preserved <laughs> kept that away. The other thing is that Dampok poem. Dampok poem is also a very favorite one. I hope you know, Bashuda, that there's some dish that it takes whole night to cook. And it is essentially and, and primarily a non-vegetarian dish. It takes whole night to cook from evening to morning. And then you taste it in the breakfast when you start to the body. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Anisul sir, for pointing out that. And I think I take the idea of the book, of course, from my uh, Muslim friends and the college that I work in. And I get to taste all these delicacies. And uh, of course, what I eat is also what I write. So I think the book comes from there. And uh, we have our head of department here and his wife, uh, you know, she, she cooks wonderful food. And I think she must have influenced uh, the metaphor that I use in the poem. So. 
drawing attention to that. And I do not think we can end this reading session without asking our moderator himself to read a poem. So, uh, Jadeep, sir, you are not being allowed to, you know, uh, play truant and go away without a poem. So I will invite uh, Professor Jadeep Sarangi, who is also known as the Bards or the Banks of Gulung, because he is primarily writing about uh, the little rivulet called Gulung in Chargram. He has got nine poetry collections to his credit. And of course, all of us uh, here know him very well. So, Jadeep, sir, over to you for your poems. Thank you, Bashudara, but it will be a mismatch of your mesmerizing poetry collection. Uh, I take this opportunity to read out one uh, poem. Is there a window? I was searching for something since I was someone's son. An entrance, perhaps, an exit might be. Spaces within where eyes could hold something like a window. Wooden one, perhaps. The walls grew thicker as I counted years. Wells touched the diff. Brick walls never found something like a window. I visited war fields where good brothers fought. I met Arjuna. He was too pompous. I met Krishna. He was too wise. I met Karna. He was too unfortunate. I moved between dharma and adharma. My life had entrances and exits. Slowly wept it around. Years passed by. Parents got me good books to read. Friends got me a split well of a career and hope. I read them all. I wrote a few too. Never had my own window for a day. Well, laser was a chariot. I never forgot a clock's time. I could, I could, I could. Searching, searching, searching lifelong. I organized my face for the world to hold. Arms for my sorrows for the rivers. Epic silence is the way I absorb the heat within. Thank you so much. Thank you for all. Thank you all wonderful poets from different parts of the globe. You made this uh, morning in India really colorful. Thank you, Anishu, sir. Thank you, Jijari, sir, and Shangjuktadi for your mentorship and your continued chill for, uh, for inspiration, inspiring all of us to write more, read more, and work for literature. Thank you, the publisher Red River, for publishing this brilliant book. Thank you, Vashudara, for a wonderful book. We hope to see a more such books for, from your pen. We shouldn't say pen in this time because we don't, you don't write, I think. You have more power to your fingers, which will type poems more. Over to Vashudara. Thank you for uh, this beautiful session. And I, I am just going back to the one sentence that I don't have words to exactly express what I'm feeling at the moment. And I hope it will come out in, in another poem someday. But I'm very grateful that we could make this uh, an oasis of beauty. Because as Adisur sir began with saying that we indeed have needed, uh, you know, we have needed something like this to help uh, anchor us, to help strengthen us and experience, uh, you know, uh, to kind of uh, <clears throat> amalgamate our experiences together. And I think that is how poetry leads to healing, because it allows us to look at things uh, through the eyes of uh, emotional logic. And when when one ends up seeing logic in things, I think much of that chaos disappears. So this ordering that poetry brings us is also poetry's healing. It helps us to order things. And even if there is pain, even if there are problems, even if there is a lot of trauma, there is a kind of logic uh, that poetry helps us see within it. And that ordering is, I think, where uh, the healing comes from. The uh, the, the, you know, the, the catharsis leads to a better and lighter soul. So I think having read and having listened to such beautiful poetry today uh, was an opportunity for all of us to connect together through poetry and to heal. And I am very, very, very grateful to everyone who could make it here today, to our guests, particularly our three speakers who are whose presence together on this forum. 
uh, is a dream come true for me. It's a, it's a dream come true for me. I will not hesitate to say this again and again. These are people I have read, I have learned from, I have richly admired, and I keep on reading you again and again. So I will not hesitate to say this, that this is a dream come true. And what happens when dreams come true? I only hope that they lead to more dreams. I only hope that there is no end and they lead to more dreams. So with the sense of finale, uh, I, will, I will only hope that I can dream more. So thank you very much for being here, uh, these three wonderful speakers and who are also poets. And most importantly, I felt so happy when they agreed to share their poems because as Sanjukta Ma'am said, uh, initially she had said that we should all, you know, be reciting your poems. And I was kind of so nervous at the thought of them reciting my poems, uh, you know, and, and yet all of them did that. And I don't know, I don't know how to respond to this uh, joy that I feel, this juiza that I feel today. And thank you for the wonderful poets who could make it across time zones to be with us. Buthina had to wake up very early and uh, Tai had to stay up very late. And Emily, I think, had to, you know, and even Robert, I think, had to, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, sacrifice on other things in order to join us for these 90 minutes here. And it was so enriching sharing minds. I'm very grateful to Red River for taking up this publication because if you have ever read a Red River book, now I think all of you, those who have uh, the book with uh, you, uh, you will realize that Red River takes as much care to bring a book into being as the poet takes to create the poems. So a Red book is, is a treasure worth possessing. It's, it's a physical treasure worth possessing. The way that Dibbi Jyoti single-handedly, it's a single-handed publishing house, you know, Dibbi Jyoti, who is a poet editor translator himself from Assam, does this single-handedly. And uh, having a book makes you want to publish a book with Red River. This is exactly what happened to me when I uh, bought my first Red River book. I was so, you know, taken up by the beauty of the cover and the designing that I wanted to have a book like that. I, I wanted them to take up my next book. And though it took quite some time, as the Jyoti said, there was almost a year of back and forth exchange of manuscripts for the manuscripts to shape well. He is a perfectionist and, uh, you know, uh, he, it, it took time. But then I think all good things take time. And I'm so glad that the book is finally here. I'm thankful to Debi Jyoti for taking up this project. I must express my debt of gratitude to my uh, academic family, particularly to my college where I work and where I live also. Uh, there is basically no distinction between my workplace and the place that I feel comfortable with. I think I feel more comfortable uh, in my department than I feel at home because I do not have my children crying to me and telling that they need milk and they need food and they need this and they need that. So I always feel that my department furnishes me creatively by giving me that necessary space to work, the necessary freedom and um, Dr. Semyahi Ibrahim is here. He has been an elder brother, a mentor. And I am very grateful that I have a place like that to anchor in where I can feel safe and my mind can feel safe and in undress, as I express in one of my poems. I am very grateful to Jaydeep, sir, because I think that the second book would not have come up if he had not insisted when he read my first book. Uh, I think the one statement that he told me was, you should not be a one book poet. This is a statement that I carry with me. After he read Moon in the Teacup, he told me that you should not be a one book poet. And I hope you are working on another collection. And I said, I was not sure about another collection because the one that had come, uh, I was not sure about that, whether it should have been there in the world. I did not know whether it should have existed. You do not know whether a poem has the authority to exist. So I was not sure about its existence. And I was therefore rather unsure about bringing up another book. So yes, it is as unsure as you know whether you do not know whether there is a place for another child in the world, whether it will be greeted with respect and affection and love. Uh, and therefore, this book is also co-dedicated to Jaydeep Sir for helping me find a home in poetry, for helping me realize that, uh, yes, poetry had a place for someone like me. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, I also am th very thankful to him for agreeing to you know, moderate this entire session. And uh, uh, thank you very much for helping put together this wonderful panel of poets. And uh, thank you, I do not have words again. I fall short of the right expression. I hope I will get it someday. And I'm very grateful to all my friends who could join it, for all my colleagues from you know, Kareem City College, 
I have Badru sir, I have Akhruddin sir, I have Anwar Shah, I have Dr. Kausar Tasneem, uh, Bian Tripathi sir, so many of them who have uh, always, uh, you know, been sources of inspiration to their constant practice. I have so many academic friends and students. Uh, I have Umesh coming, Anwar Shah is here, and so many of them. I, I am very grateful that you could make it today. It's a very, very special day for me. And thank you, all of you, for making it special. Thank you, Bhutina, for waking up early. Thank you, Tai, for agreeing to go to sleep very, very late. I know you are somewhere else. You have to use someone else's connection. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Rob, for uh, you know the comments on the book. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Bhutina. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, uh, you know, all our friends from the Northeast for, for Charna. And thank you, uh, Zuhal Timam, for joining us here. And this program would not have been possible even if one of you would have been missing. Thank you very much. It's a long vote of thanks, I hope. <laughs> and I have not bored you too much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Ibrahim, sir. Yeah. yeah, I was just thanking all, especially the organizers. It was such a nice experience today. After so many harsh days, it was a very pleasant day today. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Stay well, stay blessed, stay safe. And pleasure being here. Me. It's a pleasure being here with all of you this morning. And it was very much on dot. We started in time, finished in time. That was the beauty of it. And met new friends, made new friends, and spoke with the older ones. Great. Yeah, yes, uh, the Tambok thing remains uh, and something to do with you. So whenever yes, the time sir. permits, you will have it there at your place, the Dambok. Yes, sir. Sure, sir. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Thank, thank you, everyone. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Go to sleep, Bye. Kai. Yeah. Stay thank well. You. Stay thank safe. You. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Take care. Pronounce. We'll Take connect care. again very soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. It was really wonderful, Anshu. You uh, explained poetry so much. It will actually. I am reviewing. It will help me a lot. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, Jitendra. Yeah, Sudhra, you have to take another three years to come up with a third anthology. Yeah, it should be sooner, I think. Three years, I say, <laughs> on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be in a hurry. Three years is a good time to write 30, 40 poems, and there is no need to be. JJB uh, wants to say something. Yeah. I, I said she may even do it sooner. Who knows? Uh, poetry just comes. You can't rush it, you can't force it. I, I hope I will, uh, you know, I have more faith now to be able to write. I have more faith in poetry that poetry can accept me. And it, it all comes from the encouragement that I have received from all of you. I have, I'm extremely indebted, you know, and I think the book is very fortunate to be in lovely hands. Thank you. Very well expressed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Poonam, ma'am, for Thank joining you. us. Uh, Varsha, and you, you make it uh, hard and complete. Varsha Thank from uh, Dhanbad and uh, Professor Poonam Nigam Sahai from Ranchi. Uh, they make the academic circle of Jharkhand complete. And of course, we have plenty of representatives from Jamshedpur itself. Mm -hmm. Our college family is here. Naresh sir uh, was here. Uh, and. It's wonderful. So many of our students are here. Sunita, ma'am, thank you for being able to make it today. Uh, your love for poetry keeps all of us going. Thank you. See ya. Bye. Congratulations once again, Basu. Sakhrudin, sir, thank you. You were in your ancestral home and still you could uh, connect. Thank you. I was afraid for network issues. You could do it. Thank you so much. Actually, I'm in Gaya. Acha, acha. 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 I have a network problem. I have a network problem. I have a network Thank you, thank you. It's difficult, maybe you have joined. It's very good, Vikrudin, sir. Thank you so much. I am very so. much eager to go through your top poetry. And cool. I, have and unable, I have been unable to I send will... out uh, books to my own colleagues because I cannot post it to them and uh, I have been unable to meet them. Yes. I'm, I'm also in Balgun, it is a load shedding. 
ठीक है फकरुद्दीन सर टेक केयर हाँ थैंक यू ओके ओके बाय बाय बाय